Right around the turn of the 6th century BC, the empire of Babylon, what is now Iraq, conquered Israel and destroyed Jerusalem. A teenager named Daniel, along with many exceptional young people like him, became involuntary refugees. They were ripped from their home, from their family, from their nation, from their culture, from their religion, from everything. And they were taken to Babylon to be re-educated, re-doctrinated, re-acculturated into full-blown Babylonians. Daniel traveled to Babylon having lost all the hopes that a young Jewish man could have. Undoubtedly, many in his generation lost their faith, convinced that God had abandoned them for good. But Daniel, from the beginning, dedicated himself to a larger faith in a living God of Abraham, God of the covenant, we know as the gospel, a faith that was larger than his own dreams. And he committed himself to that. And in return, God shared his dreams with Daniel. Now, if you missed the earlier part of the study, I urge you to review some of the past sermons. I really think you would be worth your while. But by chapter 9, Daniel is getting to be an older man. It's uh, 539. It's uh, well over 60 years since Babylon's victory. And in this text, Daniel prays for God to bring a generation in exile back home. That's the purpose of the prayer. And he makes use of something, liberal use, of something that we tend to ignore in our own modern prayers. And that is confession. But it is Daniel's use of confession that makes his prayer stand out to God and virtually demands his positive answer. Let me read this text to you, Daniel 9, starting in verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ashuarius, by descent of Mede, who was made a king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord, to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely, 70 years. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God, and I made confession, saying, O Lord the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We've sinned, done wrong, and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We've not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our king and our princes and our fathers and to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us, open shame. As at this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away, and all the lands to which you have driven them, because of the treachery that they have committed against you. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame. To our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we've sinned against him. He has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us. Yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore the Lord has kept ready the calamity and has brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself, is that this day we've sinned, we've done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city Jerusalem, your holy hill, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. 
Now, therefore, our God, listen to the prayer of your servant, to his pleas for mercy, and for your own sake, O Lord, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. Oh, my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O oh my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. Mm, what a prayer. To many Christians, confession is the part of of prayer that we most like to forget. You know, confessing stuff. It makes us feel guilty, makes us feel kind of depressed. And we've already been forgiven in Christ, so why dwell in our sin? I suspect, I can't prove it, but I suspect that millions and millions of American evangelicals only confess sin seriously in a worship service when they have to. But here is Daniel devoting a a crucial part of his prayer and his petition almost entirely to confession, asking God's forgiveness for sins that resulted in sending Israel into exile. And not only that, I mean, Daniel is confessing his parents' generation's sins, his grandparents' generation's sins, his great-grandparents' generation's sins. He confesses them as if they were his own. I made confession. We have sinned. We've done wrong. We've acted wickedly. We've rebelled. We have turned aside from your commandments and and rules. Now, it's it's true that we can all identify with each other's sins because when you take the Ten Commandments, I mean, as you, as, you exp- as you extrapolate them, they cover every sin in the book. So you may break the seventh commandment about uh, uh, marriage and intimacy in a different way than I do, but we've both broken it somehow. And same for all those different commandments. So yes, Daniel can confess along with other generations, even though he didn't specifically do what they did, but he's done other things and he's hard. He knows that. So it's true he can do that. But Why? Why is, he, why is he focusing so much on this? I mean, isn't this the way prayer goes? Lord, hear me in my need. Some need has kind of driven me to pray. I mean, we may have, you know, we have some, I don't want to call them perfunctory, but there are some like form prayers we pray. We might pray uh, at mealtime, for example, or maybe before a business meeting, things like that. They're meaningful. But there are other prayers that are spontaneous, and we come to God why? Because there's something we need to talk to him about. We want him to hear. There's, there's, there's something that's troubling us or hurting us or hurting somebody we love and so on. Uh, and then we add, uh, then, Lord, uh, fix it. Lord, do something. We usually have plenty of advice for him. We tell him what to do. But anyway, please fix it. And maybe we add some praise. But the only place we have for confession might be a general admission that we don't deserve God's grace and we're depending upon him for Christ alone, which is really, really profound. It's true. It's important. And that's as far as we get into confession, kind of, kind of generically. Um, this is how most of us make requests to God. And as a result, what we're doing is we're focusing almost entirely on our own will. Now, we know from the Lord's Prayer we're supposed to see God's will, but practically speaking, how are we supposed to do that? So we just make our requests, focusing on our will, and we just kind of hope for the best. Why would God Almighty answer such prayers? Well, because he loves us. Well, he does love us in Christ, but he can love us just as much without answering a whole lot of our prayers. Well, because we ask in Jesus' name. Well, that's what we say at the end of our prayers. We put that little... We tagline there, but would Jesus actually ask for everything that we ask for? Or would he ask for other things? There's an open secret I want to tell you about having requests answered. It's so simple I'm embarrassed to share it, but I think I should. The secret (laughs) of getting a prayer answered is to ask for something God wants to give. If we ask the one who knows all things for something that he knows would not help us or is irrelevant, well, then he will not 
give it to us. It's not because he doesn't care for us, because he does care for us. Just as surely, if I ask for something God is eager to give me, it's mine. What Daniel is doing here is he is linking his request to God's will using confession as a tool. So he's, you know, he's, he's talking about Israel. He has, a, he has a request. Before he's done, he's saying, you should do this for your sake. He's bringing these things together. This is not a generic confession to highlight God's grace. Such generic confessions are good. It's good periodically, regularly, to make a general confession of sin. You know, I've sinned in your sight, word and deed. Very general, just to remind myself of grace, because we need to recapture that all the time. But Daniel, is, that's not what Daniel's doing. He's not, he's not just doing that. He's using confession as a tool to bring God's revealed will into his prayer, making his request much more likely to be answered. Look at, look at what Dan, how Daniel expands on our typical request model. Daniel still begins his request asking God to hear his cry. The request comes from a need. Need drives us to God. We ask him to hear us. Israel is miserable away from Jerusalem and the temple. And Dan is, Daniel is asking God to hear his request and bring them back. It's a big, big, big request. And Daniel ends the sequence by asking God to do something. He doesn't know how, how to do it. Just you do something. Send them back. But look at what he adds to this. He says, oh, Lord, forgive, which is most of his prayer. Forgive what? Forgive our sins that are behind our misery and forgive our sinful predispositions that would ruin anything that you would give us. You see, every misery we have is the result of sin, directly or indirectly, our sin, somebody else's sin, Adam's sin, somebody's sin. And every situation brings with it its own set of temptations in our response. Now, God cares about our comfort, and he cares about the things that we bring to him in prayer, but not nearly as much as he cares about us learning what it means to be human in his image, to think, to feel, to want, to act, to love, to hate, as Jesus does perfectly. When making a request, we, we, should, we could spend some time while we're making that request confessing related sins. Or if I'm praying for somebody else, I could, I could, I could confess kind of sins along with them, even if they're not hearing. Remember, like Daniel's confessing his, his grandparents' sins. Remember how Job confessed the sins of his children? And we could ask for forgiveness and cleansing and power to overcome those sins. So we don't say, we're not just talking about their sins over here. I can confess along with them because in some way I've, I've sinned similarly. And so I'm going to confess our sins to you, Lord God. And I'm asking you to forgive. And I'm asking you to cleanse. And I'm asking you to pow for power to overcome these things. So we can, we can do that. Not just generically say we don't deserve God's gifts, but specifically, specifically, specific sins to bring God's will and God's interests into my requests. And now, now I'm praying about two things. I'm praying about the thing that I naturally want. That's why I want God to hear me. But now, now I'm praying about things that God says he wants. And I'm making an effort to tie them together. It's interesting as dialogue goes on between the Lord and his will. I mean, you, that can change your prayers. But I'm trying to tie those things together. On D-Day, the army rangers needed to climb a steep cliff, Point du Oc. Um, they had ropes, but you know, if you try to throw a rope up a cliff, it just doesn't work very well. There's just not enough substance to a rope to throw it very far. So what they did, of course, was to attach the ropes to substantial, relatively weighty hooks, grappling hooks. And then they used rockets to shoot the grappling hooks up to the top of the cliff. And, of course, that brought the ropes up with it. So some could climb the ropes, and then eventually the whole main body could uh, proceed. Our requests are crucially important to us. But let's face it, they are often rather lightweight 
in the scheme of things, or it's not clear how they relate to the scheme of things. So why not tie them to weightier matters, the things that God cares about, and shoot them up to God? Lord, I come to you asking you for help to get my son into a good school, a good university. That's a good prayer. But, you know, what exactly are you asking? Because maybe your son is looking more to party a little bit than study, and maybe you really want him to be close to home, whether or not that's good. And what are you asking? Okay. Lord, I ask you to help get my son into a good university. But, well, but wait, I have more. I want to confess the sins that my son and I, sometimes we make choices for the wrong reasons. And I want to confess that to you. I've seen some of the factors he, he has in choosing a college, and they aren't, they aren't the best, and they don't include some of the ones that are important to you. And, and you know, you look back on my life, and I've done just the same thing. And you remember when that happened. And so, Father, would you please forgive us for those sins? This is just a prayer you're privately praying to God. Please forgive us for these sins and help us to use factors in this decision that make sense from your perspective. And help us to design an approach that would make you proud in this instance. Well, you know, at this point in such a prayer, God, Daniel knows that God is really listening. And so he says this amazing phrase, you know, oh, Lord, pay attention. It literally means like a listen up. I mean, that sounds so strange. That sounds so inappropriate to say that to God. And it would be if all we were doing were talking about our own personal desires as if we were equals. And it's not that God doesn't enjoy listening to us to discuss our desires. He does. He loves it when we talk to him as part of building our relationship together. But he has no intention of answering every request we might make. That's just not how he rules the universe. I mean, Jesus promises this. He says, look, you come to God with a request, and I can tell you this, he'll answer it well. He says, you come to God asking for, you come, you come to your father asking for a fish, well, you may not get a fish, but you won't get a stone, okay? He's going to answer it well. We can always know that. But our specific requests get a lot more interesting to God when it is mixed with specific confession, a desire for forgiveness and cleansing and strength to overcome the sins that surround that is situation. God is very interested in that. This is one of my life verses. I love it. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth. To strengthen those whose hearts, I, I, I remember it, is wholly his, as commit, fully committed to him. God loves to casually listen to us. He's always listening to us. And talk about what we want. It's part of us getting to know each other. But when we start to confess sin that we have not obeyed him, and we start asking for power over that sin, his passive attention becomes an active focus. His eyes are just looking all the time. He hears everybody. It's great. He's looking for those whose hearts are his. That's what it says. It's just like we have just said, Lord, listen up. I, 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 I'm asking for something I know you want. Boom. When we genuinely ask God for something he says he wants to give it, it's ours. And that's how, that's how this uh, sequence ends, uh, with a very confident expectation that God will act because he surely will pursue his will for our lives. He surely will do that. And if his will is reasonably connected to something we want, well, frankly, he still knows a lot more than we do, so it may not work out the way we had asked, but now we have a pretty serious conversation going. In Daniel's case, he tied his request to bring Israel home with lots of specific confession and requests for God to forgive and cleanse and empower them so they can change and, and, and be the kind of people he wants them to be. He didn't know how God would bring Israel home. He didn't try to tell him how. He just expected God to act and to respond to such honest prayers that took his will seriously in the midst of our need. And boy, did God act. He led that new Persian king to completely overhaul the Babylonian strategy for tying together the empire. 
He had a new idea. I don't know where he got it. Instead of suppressing local religion and kidnapping the best and the brightest, you know, to re-educate them, the Persian king thought, you know, it would probably be good if we encouraged local religion, let the best, best and the brightest stay home so they can beseech all the gods in the empire to bless me. <laughs> Made sense to him. And the next thing you know, the refugees were sent home. Daniel didn't make that happen. God made it happen. But he made it happen because Daniel asked him to do it. And he tied that request very securely to God's revealed will. And the result was that history was made. And besides, besides a whole new domestic policy, God gave a little, <laughs> a little something extra for Daniel. <laughs> These are the next verses that we're going to look at next week. Um, Daniel asked that Israel would return to the land in order to fulfill their purpose. And the Lord was so pleased that somebody would ask that, that he sent his angel Gabriel immediately to reveal to Daniel the whole enchilada. I mean, the whole timeline for Israel's purpose as a nation before it became the international nation we know as the church. It's one of the most outstanding uh, prophecies ever recorded. Sometimes God truly does do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. And we'll look at that next week. So as I ask God for anything that's beyond my daily bread, I want to identify the sins that are kind of related or surround that kind of request. Sins that maybe cause the problem or, or, or bring temptations to me as I try to deal with it. And I want to freely, openly, specifically confess my sins in those areas. And if I'm praying for somebody else, confess our sin in those areas. Probably the sin I see, but I'm going to identify with it. So it's not condemning. My sin too. And so that I stand before God, genuinely asking him to forgive, to cleanse, to work in my life, to work in our lives. And I do all that not to feel guilty. My guilt is not an issue. I mean, Daniel says it. We don't present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, because of your great mercy. He understood God's Abrahamic promise to die in order to assure our blessing, the promise that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. His righteousness became ours. Our sin was all forgiven, period. The reason we dwell on confession is not to feel guilty. It is to wrap our request inside the things that matter to God. Because the more I do that, the more powerful my prayers become. Daniel it was very good at tying his dreams to God's dreams and letting the Lord take him wherever he wanted. A larger faith uses confession to link our concerns with God's. And then letting God act in wonderful ways, probably in ways we didn't even fully expect. As an assignment, should you be interested, I encourage you to just process a prayer through Daniel 9, 19. I encourage you to pick something that you are asking for God to give you. Identify what sins have either caused the problem or could ruin any solution because of their temptation value. Confess your sins in those, in those regard. Uh, confess the, the same sins and anybody that you're praying for. Make that our sin that you're kind of confessing alongside them. Ask God to forgive you both. Work his will in your life. And then brace yourself because God is going to act. Let's pray. Father, we come to your table now, and we come with some very deep desires, desires that we long for you to fulfill. But just in coming to your table, we, we realize that you've got some pretty deep desires too. And you long for us to become like your son. And so, Lord, today... Let's see if we can put both those things together. Please hear our confession of sin that may have helped cause our problem or might tempt us to ruin whatever you, whatever you gave us. 
Lord God, here at the table today, would you meet us at our deepest desires? And would you help us meet you in your deepest desires for us? And then answer our prayers. We ask in the name of Christ. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. Excuse me, but I have to get used to carrying this around for a while. For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you. That on the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And after he blessed it, he said, this is my body. It is broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And then after the, after the supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness, your forgiveness. As often as you, as you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. We're told as often as we eat this bread, drink this cup, then we'll do that until our Lord returns. And so in his name, I, I invite you to his table.